Welcome to the Explore the Circular Economy show by the Ellen McCarr Foundation, the show where we talk about the transition away from a linear take-make-waste economy to one where we design out waste and pollution, keep products and materials in use, and regenerate natural systems. My name is Seb. Uh, I'm part of the learning team here at the Foundation, and I'm your host for this show. But actually, I'm joined by my co-host as well, who is... Laura. And thanks, Seb. I'm very excited to be co-hosting today's show where we're going to be bringing the circular economy to life by sharing some of the most inspiring and exciting examples of the concept in action. Yeah, so last week we started to talk about a few stories of the circular economy. Um, we talked about Replenish, we talked about Gerard Street, we started to get into buildings. And at the end of the show, we kind of had this reflection. Well, a lot of these stories kind of only speak to a part of the circular economy picture. And we introduced the notion of technical and biological cycles. So technical being really human made things um, and biological being uh, things that can return to the soil more safely. And especially the biological talking to that third principle that I've already mentioned, regenerate natural systems. So today we're going to be going very fast through a number of stories that start to explain that part of the circular economy. And we're joined once again by Nick Jeffries from the Insight and Analysis team here at the Foundation, a, a case study aficionado. And we're also joined this time by Emma Chow, who is the lead of our food, the food initiative here at the Ellen McCarr Foundation. Welcome back, Nick, and welcome, Emma. We're really excited to have you here with us. Um, so, Emma, this word regenerative keeps coming up every time we talk about the circular economy. But... Could you explain what we mean by this and share with us uh, one of your favorite examples to explain it? Yeah, and hi everyone. Um, it's really great to be on and, and such an important piece when it comes to language. And we often get this question of what does regenerative actually mean? And for me, I like to think of it comparing to perhaps sustaining what could be degraded land, for instance. Um, rather than actually improving or maximizing the value of, and the ability for that place to regenerate. Nature is inherently regenerative when untouched. Um, so how can we, through our own human actions, for instance, how we grow food, how can actually be tapping into that regenerative, those cycles of nature? Um, that exists no matter what. And so I think we see some really great examples around the world at different scales, but to look at some larger scales example, there's one in California that I like that is called Marin Carbon Project in Northern California, and it's part of the state's um, plans and really activities. That's how to mitigate climate change by actually looking at rangeland. And there's 58 million hectares of rangeland in the state. So it's um, actually the top representation of land use in the state. And so they're working with, I think it's 19 farms now, we started a few years ago, to um, be looking at how to raise livestock and grains as well, grow grains in a way that's regenerative. And actually the very production of that food is not only helping to feed people all over the country and in the state, but actually helping to sequester carbon from the atmosphere and help tackle climate change. So that, you know, that's an example of, um, of positively impacting the environment versus just mitigating against negative environmental effects. And obviously, Emma, you've given us an example of um, that happening at a large scale, but often in the farming and the, in the food sector, we kind of talk about it operating at, at different scales. Um, you know, smallholder farmers have a huge role to play. Is this, is this something, Nick, that can only play out if you've got thousands of hectares of land or, or what, what other scales can this operate at? Yeah, uh, yeah, thanks for that question. And, and it's great to be back on the show, uh, by the way. Um, yes. It was small... by popular demand, Nick, by the way. We, <laughs> we had to bring you back. Oh, flattery will get you everywhere, Seb. Um, yes, small, small farms, very important. Actually, most farms in the world are small farms. 98% of the farms around the world are less than 10 hectares. And smallholder farmers, on the whole, farm you know very well. Um, but uh, but just to sort of one of my favourite examples of uh, of how you can actually get more productivity and reduce your impact at the small scale is from Japan. Uh, it's a, a farmer called Takao Furuno, uh, and he was he is a a paddy farmer, so he farms rice. Now, about 20, 20 years ago, so he was already sort of starting to make the transition to organic. Um, but 
one of the things he had to wrestle with on his farm was was snails. Like snails are, have a voracious appetite for uh, uh, rice plants, and so what he decided to do, he thought about this a little bit, and he, his whole thing was actually thinking about the farm more as an ecosystem, designing it more as, as an ecosystem than a factory. He thought, okay, well, what likes eating snails? And so he introduced uh, ducklings into the paddy field once the uh, once the plants were about two weeks old, and they ate the snails, but as a bonus, their poop also puts nutrients into the paddy water. Now he took this one stage further. One thing he was really lacking in his uh, paddy field was nitrogen. What's a good replacement for nitrogen? And there's actually a paddy weed that fixes nitrogen in its early stages, but then competes in its, the later stage of its growth. And so thinking about this a little bit, he thought, well, what can I introduce that could sort of address this? And he, and he introduced fish. It's actually a type of fish called a loach fish. And this loach fish actually kept that weed in check, but it allowed it to grow enough to fix the nitrogen. And so then you, so then you had the situation where you've got the, the, the loach, the duck, the rice, and all working together. And in fact, it was the paddy field became so nutrient rich that he needed a way of actually mopping up the surplus nutrients. So he started planting figs and fruits and vegetables around the periphery of the, uh, the paddy field. And the result was that going for, starting from one revenue, uh, revenue stream, like rice, within a few short years, he moved to five or six. And actually the rice yield increased by 20 to 50%. So he went from rice to rice, plus duck eggs, plus duck meat, plus fish, plus all these vegetables. And the overall result of that, because inputs, his fertilizers and pesticide inputs were reduced as well, were fact eliminated, his profits went up three times because of that sort of more ecosystem approach. So this I love that. And that's, that's classic circular economy, getting more from less, you know, and redirecting resources in a way that benefits the whole system. I just wanted to say, Nick, that I think this is an, an impressive example. So I was wondering if it has expanded, uh, like beyond the beyond this uh, this person's farm or beyond borders. Yeah, well, that basic principle of sort of getting different species together, working to you know to, in a sort of symbiotic, beneficial way, for Japan in that particular context, rice, fish, and duck were were, were the right combination. But say in southern China. It, they they pair fish with mulberry bushes, and on those mulberry bushes they grow silkworms. So that's that nice combination. In Vietnam, they combine uh, sort of vegetables with pigs with fish. So yeah, depending on the context, you get the right um, selection of uh, of species. Uh, yeah, it's, it's context dependent, but the principles are the same. Thank you, Nick. And it's not just only about the way we grow food, right? It's, it's about what do we do with the crops once the, 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 the well, once they are harvested. And I know that a lot of food gets uh, lost uh, on the way to the market. And in fact, in in many in many countries around the world, I think it's up to forty uh, percent of food that it gets lost. Um, so, do we have any good examples that are addressing this, uh, Emma? Perhaps that's. Yeah, yeah, these these losses that we often don't see are invisible and, and many of them actually happening at the farm level, especially in places where you don't have really good access to um, logistics and cold chain, for instance. So you have, for instance, banana farmers or any fruit farmers in very tropical climates, you can often have a lot of surplus at the farm level that ends up rotting um, or in the worst cases is, is burned. And of course, there's a lot of value and to keep at the highest value is actually maintaining it and turning it into what we can call like a value added product, which is, which is a shelf stable product. So um, one great innovation and example of this is a Brazilian startup um, that recently won a Thought for Food, which is a global food challenge platform. They ran the first ever circular economy of food challenge last year. And we saw 3,000 applicants, and the winner was this company, Feitosa Food Tech in Brazil, who's working with farmers, primarily agroecological farmers, to be taking these surplus bananas that would go wasted at the farm level and actually creating products like this banana ketchup that they create. And so it's not only the fruit inside, but actually the skin as well, which we often aren't eating um, when we're consuming bananas. So they've created a process to be able to use that and create this delicious product. Um, and also when you think of circular economy, right? It's not just 
the product itself, but the packaging and the delivery. So they're using reusable, um, fully recyclable packaging too. So they're really thinking about the full system um, in that approach. And that's, again, just one example of what you can do with this current organic waste coming out of our food system, um, which of course can be captured and create lots of value and, and good for us and for nature and economies. I, I also personally love bananas, so I'm very pleased to hear that the <laughs> full crop is being put to good use by that innovation. So we've talked a bit about the sourcing of food, which seems you know seems like quite a good place to start when you're talking about um, a food system. We've talked now, I guess the Fertosa example is an example of how do we actually make the most of food? So many of our crops and across the value chain, there's so much um, opportunity there. And I, I was thinking about opportunity there when you mentioned, Emma, that you, there were 3,000 applicants to that competition you mentioned. That just shows you the, the potential for innovation in this space when you start thinking differently. Um, but to encourage us just to think slightly differently ourselves, of course, when we talk about the other part of the circular economy, and we often talk about the biological cycle being a little bit less explored at times. It isn't just food, of course, is it, Nick? It, that, you know, there's there's a whole ream of innovations in the bioeconomy that are worth providing an example of. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But before I uh, answer that question, um, I'm sure many of the audience are wondering what these are behind me. Um, so this is a classic example of what Emma was illustrating earlier. These are actually the scapes, the tops of garlic. And they're removed uh, at some point in the in, in the in the plant's life, so that the bulbs increase. But these traditionally, these would be thrown away or not, well, fed to cattle, which of course is you know a good use for them. But they're actually very very delicious, barbecued uh, with olive oil. Um, and uh, yeah, anyway, I just want to do. Bit, like, this is almost turning into a bit of like a cooking <laughs> tip show as well. If you get get yourself some tops of garlic, fry them in some barbecue yeah. sauce. Absolutely delicious. Honestly, Lockdown I'm tips really on a lovely yeah. hot <laughs> afternoon. Yeah, but yes, you're right. It's not only food products that can be created through uh, agricultural byproducts. Uh, I've got another prop here. Just like to show this to you all, and what it looks like. What well, it looks like leather. Yeah, smells a little bit like the forest. What this is is 100% mycelium. Uh, this is mushroom. Uh, that has been grown on agricultural waste and then just uh, to, to, to get weather protected has been tanned with tea. Um, I, love, I love showing this example because what, what, what this came from was a, a sort of an innovation journey that started with two designers from upstate New York. They wanted to solve the problem of polystyrene. So polystyrene, which is a, you know, that packaging material which is used perhaps once and then takes thousands of years to degrade, often ends up in the beaches of the world. And they thought, well, you know, can we, you know, what can we do to provide an alternative to this? And, and what, what they noticed by observing nature closely is that mycelium is a very good natural cementitious material. And where they, where they come from in, uh, in, in upstate New York, there's a lot of corn growing. And so there's a lot of corn stover, a lot of um, byproducts, the stems of the, you know, the corn uh, processing. And so what they did is they combined the mycelium with the corn stover, put them in molds and created this, you know, wonderful, you know, replacement for polystyrene. Once you've finished using it, just chuck it in the ground and it sort of breaks down and then feeds the next uh, generation of crops. So from that start, they gradually sort of changed the sort of amount of mycelium in the mix, changed the sort of consistency of the mix. And then very soon they had uh, lampshades, uh, furniture, uh, architectural paneling. Um, uh, they even built a uh, 150 foot high tower uh, out of uh, mushroom blocks in New York. And then they moved the mycelium uh, lever all the way to the right and then it was 100% mycelium and they got leather, yeah? And then, uh, and for the first time actually, Stella McCartney, who for 20 years did not use leather in any of her collections, she made a leather handbag, a mushroom leather handbag. Um, and then more recently, I understand, they've started using the mycelium in the production of alternative proteins. So they use the mycelium as a scaffold that allows you to grow these proteins on it. And so you can have whole steaks rather than sort of mint. So it's opening up a whole new area in alternative proteins. And so it's just this wonderful 
illustration of you know circular economy system thinking being this sort of wellspring of innovation that's just opened up this completely new material innovation category and now they've actually uh, uh, they've opened up their, their platform to people uh, entrepreneurs all around the world and so if you've got a particular feedstock say maybe rice husks in Vietnam or China you've got a demand for something in that area you can match up that supply feedstock to the demand and tailor make your products uh, for that area so i think that's a yeah a lovely did, innovation did you, did you say that they've they've as a 130 foot tower of mushroom blocks 100, 150 foot yeah was that, what was that tower. to just demonstrate its potential well, or just was, demonstrate yeah yeah demonstrate it's just like if you imagine mycelium as cement so if you just if you change the uh the, the sort of proportion of mycelium you've got these really strong blocks big enough to support a 150 foot tower I mean, I think it's uh, what's. I mean, as well as being a great illustration of what regenerate natural systems might mean, if you're talking about materials like clothing or packaging or or building materials, um, it's also just a, a fact. You know, it just it presents a different kind of building block on which you might build the economy because it, you know, the diversity of uses that you've listed there. Um, the building blocks piece moves me neatly, Emma into talking about something that's very crucial to our food initiative which is which is i mean one of the fundamental questions i guess that we asked was where where do you start if you're trying to you know people call the food system the mother of all systemic problems um and and so we focused a lot on cities um and i wonder do we have a story about innovation in cities that kind of illustrates why there or helps to maybe start to illustrate why that's an interesting place to be talking about shifting the food system. Yeah, yeah, cities have, you know, a lot of potential, a lot of power in, in all systems, not just food. And really when we think about these biological materials and what Nick just kind of shed some light on in terms of, there's so much potential of taking these biological materials and byproducts, right, from our food system and using it in the broader bioeconomy. And that really opens up these full, as we call in a very techie term, but value cascades that we can generate. And with biological materials, what's something that's unique is they're not actively, or they are actively decomposing and degrading. So space and time are really critical when we're designing solutions. Um, I'm gonna just highlight the plant in Chicago, which is a very unique for-profit and non-profit partnership where in one place, which is actually a repurposed former meatpacking plant in Chicago, there's about 16 local food production businesses. And they are doing everything from brewing beer to baking bread, growing vegetables. Um, but they're taking through this design, and you can really reference industrial symbiosis here when you look at the blueprint of it, um, taking what would be waste from one company and then using that as feedstock ingredients input for another company. And some of these are, again, food products and also for broader bioeconomy uses. They have um, an anaerobic digester on site, which again is taking some of these materials, ensuring that they're um, creating a, their own electricity. So you start to think about how, what are, what are these solutions? What's the economy running on as well in terms of renewables and energy sources? Um, so yeah, just the spatial aspect and I think the, the plant in itself is almost like a micro scale um, view of what cities at a broader level, how they can be approaching the design of their spatial planning um, to really enable these flows and design out the concept of waste altogether. How many enterprises did you say that uh, work together at the plant? 16. 16, wow. Um... This is, this is definitely a, a great example, in my opinion, of collaboration and innovation and that probably has a great potential to be expanded into many other cities around the world. Um, so you just shared uh, a, a great example of how resources can be shared among different enterprises and, and creating different loops within a building. Um, and today it's, it's a reality uh, that cities produce um, a lot of organic waste, and it is expected uh, to double by 2025. Um, I think it's uh, only a very small pr proportion, it's less than 2%, and Nick can correct me if I'm wrong, um, of the valuable uh, nutrients in this um, 
organ discarded organic resources gets actually looped back um, to productive use in cities. Um, so Nick, do we have an example uh, that addresses this in, in cities specifically? Yeah, well, first, Lara, I would never dare to correct you in any shape or form. But yes, I do have an example. AgriProtein, which is a company that started in uh, Cape Town. And I think AgriProtein is a great example of, as you said, that at the moment, you know, uh, food flows into cities and then it ge they generate huge like uh, volumes of organic waste. But most of this waste is either sort of dumped on landfill or ends up in rivers or, you know, creating carbon emissions and, 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 and sort of pests, or, you know, pests and smells around the city. Um, so we have that issue of waste management, but we also have an issue of uh, food security. So, you know, the, the population of the world is growing, uh, it's getting more urbanized, uh, it's getting more affluent, demand for things like fish are growing. Uh, but we are overfishing our oceans. And, and so the, the, the need for aquaculture, in other words, fish growing is increasing. But what do we feed our fish in our fish farms? Fish. It's fish byproducts or not by, bycatch from, uh, uh, from commercial ocean fishing and thus removing like millions and millions of fish from sort of lower down the marine food chain and therefore endangering those, those marine ecosystems. So what AgriProtein have done is they take each of their factories and they have two, one in Cape Town, one in Durban. They take about uh, 250 tons of organic waste a day and they feed that to black soldier fly larvae. Now, these black soldier fly, they, they are incredible uh, creatures. They can actually increase their weight by 200 times in 14 days. So they plump these soldier fly larvae up and then uh, and when they get to their full size before they become adults, uh, they 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 dry them, um, and then they they that provides a very nutritious feed both to the aquaculture industry and the poultry industry. Um, but then what's left over after the insects have uh, finished feeding uh, is this sort of frass or insect poo. Now that poo is it's, it's a bit like uh, worm compost. It's highly highly nutritious. And then that can then go back to the peri-urban peri or the sort of, you know, the growing areas around cities, and that can be used to support uh, regenerative agriculture. And so I just think it's just, you know, agroprotein, it's a wonderful example of what was previously construed as waste and costly to deal with, is turned into this, well, eat pretty well, put it this way, each of those factories turn over about seven or eight million a year in revenue and employ about 30 people. So it's an incredible uh, economic uh, job creating opportunity, as well as addressing food security, addressing uh, the sort of threats to marine ecosystems. Um, it's, a, it's a lower carbon intensity than equivalents. So it just ticks so many well. And basically it fulfills all three principles of the circular economy. So I think that's a, a, a wonderful example. And they base themselves out of cities, right? Or they try to locate deliberately near cities. Is that true? Yes. Yeah, because that's where the feedstock is. For you know, it's it's a canteen waste or abattoir waste. The feedstock comes, but also the demand for fish is in the cities, and also and and, there, and these commercial fish farms can be located around as well. So you've got these really nice, a bit like the symbiosis that Emma was talking about. These really nice symbiotic relationships that can form, that sort of driven by the sort of demand from cities. And we had a question in actually on YouTube. Thanks to everyone who's watching and, and sharing those about exactly about that. Where does insect farming fit under a circular economy framework? Well, we've hopefully given a, a, an example that illustrates one of the possibilities. And we've also had a question from um, Tanya or Tanaya. Sorry, maybe pronouncing the name wrong. Um, they pick up on the topic of what well, their, their question is literally besides food from plants, how can we integrate poultry, fish, et cetera, into regenerative processes? And I guess we've kind of given a couple of examples of that already with the duck rice fish um, example. Um, we've done it with uh, with actually, the, the I guess, the replacement fish farming example that, or the supporting a fish farming example you've just given, Nick. But th there might be a broader question, Emma, around, um, and there probably are viewers asking, well, what, what, where does this all sit in the large scale conversations about veganism, vegetarianism? Any quick comments on that? Yeah, a couple of quick comments, because really coming back to that whole regenerative mindset and thinking in systems, right? It's not a black and or white. Yes, we should eat meat. No, we shouldn't eat meat. That's the silver bullet answer. Rather, as we realize with all food, because you can also be growing plant 
ingredients in very linear destructive ways that can be just as or even more destructive than how you're raising animal-based ingredients. So really from the outset, taking this integrative mindset to design these solutions, some of which, especially Nick has alluded to with things like duck rice farming, right? Livestock are part of that. Livestock can be part of a regenerative system. So we need to embed that in the very design and, and that needs to flow into how we design products, how we design dishes, how we evolve our food cultures to move in line with that. Great. Well, so from from looking at the source, you know, how do we grow our food, regenerative growing of food, to how we make the most of our food, to how that plays out in our cities and how do we transform the notion of waste altogether? And in fact, how the biological cycle, this notion of the food part of the circular economy is interwoven intrinsically with other aspects of the circular economy. We've really explored it all. I think, you know, the story that the story about the duck rice farm is a duck rice fish farm is really interesting to me because the farmer asked himself a question, you know, how, almost how would nature deal with these pests? You know, it's not that nature is overwhelmed with a particular kind of species. And and the way the way you told that story, Nick, and the way that each of those challenges was kind of resolved is, is a really interesting example of a different way of thinking. So thank you very much to Emma and Nick for joining us um, this morning, this afternoon, this evening, depending on which time zone you're in. Yeah, great to great to be on the show. <laughs> really enjoyed it.